Hello, everyone. Thank you for um, joining Center for Justice and Law on this spotlight interview where we talk about health justice and law. My name is Gao. I'm a student coordinator with the CJL at Hamlin University. And um, here for our spotlight interviews, we talk about immigrant and refugee health. Um, feel free to drop any questions or comments in the chat. Um, today, we will be hearing from Elise and Lourdes. And uh, we've asked you to join us today because of your experiences relating to our topic. Um, you both help a lot of the community that struggles with services, resources, and work. And I think that is amazing. And it takes a lot of dedication and hard work. And I admire that. Um, so we're, we'll start off with this first question here. Um, can you tell us about yourselves and what you do exactly with the Agricultural Workers Project? Um, yeah, so um, I'll start it off. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Lourdes. And like Al said, I'm with the Agricultural Worker Project in Minnesota and North Dakota. I work as a paralegal and an outreach worker with the program. Um, I've been a part of the team for about two years now. Um, and I conduct outreach. So that means um, I travel across the state of Minnesota with colleagues. Uh, reaching agricultural workers in the state to uh, inform them about our services, answer any questions that they have related to, to work or uh, resources in the communities, including health um, and food. Um, and I also provide uh, case assistance to the attorneys in our office. Um, and also as a part of outreach that includes uh, social media management. So uh, working on our Facebook page and providing information on there uh, to the community and specifically to farm workers. And I'm Elise, I'm the project manager for the Agricultural Worker Project at Smurls. Our unit has been around for over 30 years. It used to be called Migrant Legal Services. Um, we had a name change uh, to what it is now as we kind of shifted some expanded our case priorities and so we're able to help with um, employment related issues that are affecting uh, agricultural workers in minnesota north dakota housing issues um, wage theft contract violations labor trafficking things like that and so lourdes myself and a couple others travel very extensively um, for most of the year, May to October, so um, reaching workers at their homes in the evenings and educating them about their rights. And it's that method that they're able to learn about their rights, hear about our services, and then they'll reach out to us. Someone like Lourdes or some of our other paralegals will do an intake with them. And if we determine that they're eligible for our services and that it is um, something we're able to assist with, um, then one of our attorneys will go ahead and represent them and assist with the remedy. And if we aren't able to directly represent them, then we follow up and provide a referral. Um, can you tell us about how you as an individual um, connect to our theme this year of immigrant and refugee health, justice and law? Or uh, what is your personal connection to our topic? You know. One of the first things that comes to mind is um, the concept of vulnerability. And so I'm not gonna directly answer your question, <laughs> indirectly answer it, um, but I am definitely passionate about assisting folks who are vulnerable. Sometimes it is because of um, status or um, their cultural background um, and you know, walking alongside them with whatever they're experiencing. Um, I was previously doing anti-labor uh, traffic, counter labor trafficking work um, at a nonprofit on the East Coast. Um, and so then, you know, this unit does some of that work as well. So that's a little bit. Um, I grew up in a pretty diverse area of Minneapolis and have always had a passion for um, cross-cultural experiences and making sure people feel valued and heard and that their stories are brought to the table. So that's kind of one of the reasons why I'm at large drawn to this topic? Yeah, I will say um, I 
first um, grew passionate about um, employment rights when I was interning at a different legal aid office um, outside of Minnesota. Um, doing a similar internship in terms of like conducting intake interviews, which is a large part of my current role. Um, and in that office, I talked to a lot of uh, workers who were suffering from wage theft and discrimination at work. Um, and a lot of the people I spoke to on a daily basis um, coming to our office with those issues were people who looked like me. Um, and so I felt direct, like directly impacted and motivated to help them. I realized that a lot of um, the clients that suffer these, these kinds of problems at work come directly from my community. Um, so that really grew me to want to advocate um, for, for justice. And so when I returned to Minnesota, I was looking for programs similar um, to where I was previously at. And I learned about the Agriculture Worker Project that directly helps farm workers with um, employment issues. So that's what personally drew me to, to this issue and to this organization. Um, so on the website, there's like a list of, I guess, different kinds of workers you guys help with. So can you define agricultural workers and who would you um, like, who would you consider to be as an agricultural worker? Yeah, um, so gosh, we have a, a variety of different <laughs> definitions uh, for um, agricultural workers, but so that would include um, uh, people who work in the fields, who work uh, for canneries, um, dairy workers, um, and also including migrant workers, so workers who come from different states to Minnesota to do agriculture work. Um, this also includes workers with the visa, with the H-2A visa that allows workers outside of the country to temporarily work um, legally in the, in the U.S. doing agriculture work. Um, I know I'm seeing a few that you may. Yeah, Lourdes hit on a lot of it, and it is <clears throat> largely based how, on how we receive or where we receive our funding. And so that determines like who kind of categories of worker ag agricultural workers that we're able to serve, um, folks who are operating um, farm equipment and, and maintaining those um, folks. There's uh, some representation we can do for folks who are on the H2B temporary visa. Again, that gives them a legal status. For, um, and that is not just agricultural specific, but who we can serve from that visa um, are those doing forestry work? Um, and what else? Um, sometimes there's folks who are misclassified on their visa. So if there's some overlap with agriculture, we'll assess it and um, see if it's something we're able to help uh, assist with as well. Um, livestock, um, those who work with poultry, um, and um, but with not necessarily meat packing. So that's different. Um, yeah, so, so those are some of the other populations. And I guess one other thing that I'll mention is there's kind of the type of work, but then there's also, as Lourdes mentioned, kind of the nature of how they perform that work. So some people do travel away from their permanent home um, to, perform, to perform this kind of work. And so they're considered a migrant worker. Um, there's year-round workers, and those are usually those who do um, livestock work, like working on a dairy farm because that's a 24 seven operation, um, unlike crops, which are only growing part of the year. Um, and then there's folks who do, you know, maybe are settled in an area, but they only do agricultural work um, a few months out of the year. And we kind of define them as being seasonal. So um, there's a lot of different ways we break it down, um, but there are different rights allocated to folks within uh, each state based on those categories. Um, so what do you both like about doing the work? I mean, uh, for me, like, 
performing outreach and actually doing doing hands-on work and seeing people in person um, is really valuable to me. And, and knowing that I can play a role in, in even presenting information, presenting information about their rights that they weren't aware of, that they can take that piece of information um, and that might be motivating enough for them to give us a call or want to seek help um, and advocate for themselves um, or know that they can come to us to help to help advocate for them. Um, and just being, being able to, to, to talk to people. I, I love being able to travel outside of the office and um, seek workers out and talk to them, have a conversation, um, learn about what, what brings them here, what kind of work they're doing and providing um, assistance that they may need. Mm -hmm. Outreach is also definitely um, one of the favorite parts of being part of this unit for me. Um, we put a lot of time and strategy into determining how we're gonna meet with workers, where we're gonna go, um, kind of the timing and routes and things like that, and investigating, doing a lot of investigation ahead of time um, so that we know what kind of workers we're talking to. Are they working on a poultry farm? Are they um, doing dairy work? Like, you know, refreshing ourselves and making sure that they get the right legal information that they need. Um, and like Lourdes said, it's so satisfying to talk to people face to face and um, they might decide to call us um, in a couple months after the season is over um, and, you know, with a question about moving forward. Um, but it, it is definitely satisfying. I would say the other thing is, um, you know, the pandemic last year did really, um, uh, it basically prohibited us from going on um, in-person outreach very much because, right, we're concerned for the safety of workers and for our own safety, but really primarily theirs because they don't necessarily have the same protections that we do. Um, and so our team really stepped it up and was able to come up with some very impressive um, other kind of modified outreach efforts that we could share with you about. But that was really satisfying to see how creative our team is to, and still so determined to get information to workers despite the pandemic. Um, so under what circumstances would someone be eligible in order to um, receive the services? Yeah, so um, Southern Minnesota Regional Legal Services, SMIRLS, is our parent organization. Um, and so we receive, uh, SMIRLS receives funding from the Legal Services Corporation, which is the government's arm for um, kind of awarding um, funding to nonprofit legal aids uh, organizations. And so um, there are some eligibility requirements that we have to uphold for that. Um, our unit, um, is able to kind of has a broader range of service area. So we're able to represent folk um, agriculture workers in all counties of Minnesota and North Dakota. Um, <clears throat> and most states actually have, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a comparable farm worker project in their respective states. Um, and so we're able to, you know, represent throughout the state and then they have to be financially eligible. So we kind of have a a percentage of um, from the federal poverty guidelines that we look at and see if we can assess and if not a referral would um, come up likely. Um, and then also if they do, they do also have to either be on an H2A visa or if they are um, residing here in the US not on a visa, they do have to have some other status. Um, and so we're not able to, we're currently not able to represent folks who are undocumented. Um, but we do um, have some good referral agencies that we're able to direct folks to when they reach out to us. Um, and then the last thing would be um, kind of if those other boxes are checked, we'd still need to make sure that um, the person's concern falls within one of our case priorities and that we're the right legal aid um, entity to assist with their concern. And again, if not, um, we'll equip them either with a referral or kind of some next step information to do investigation for um, someone from the private bar or elsewhere. I don't have anything to add to that. Okay. <laughs> um, so are you guys only like available in this state? I think 
North Dakota was also mentioned on the website, but I'm, I wasn't too sure. Like, are, are you guys accessible to other states in the country? Do you want to talk about the Advocate Network? Um, well, we have, so one of the other paralegal and outreach workers um, and the other attorney in, they're based in Moorhead, Minnesota, and they focus on conducting outreach in, in North Dakota um, specifically. But as far as the advocacy network, I can say that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we're, our unit specifically works uh, in, or does outreach and represents farm workers in our two state service area. But nationally, um, as I said before, there are farm worker. Um, kind of legal aid projects throughout the country. Um, and so if someone, we sometimes get referrals from the Texas program um, and make referrals to other states as well. Um, it's fun now in my current position that sometimes my work overlaps with the um, farm worker project out in North Carolina where I used to live and work. And so um, we have a very it's kind of a unique tight knit community. So if someone is not eligible for our unit services, be just by the nature of the, uh, the state, um, we'll connect them with another state. There are a few states in the US that don't have um, such a project, but that doesn't come up too often. So are there any like other services that you guys haven't like mentioned that um, the project provides? And how, like, in ways, like, how do you guys commit to improving the, I guess, work environment and living conditions of the agricultural workers? Mm -hmm. So I can prefer to jump in if you want to. So to your first question, um, outreach is a huge bulk of what we do. Um, so farm workers don't have to be eligible for our services in order to get our um, educational materials. We're not screening people on outreach. We're not asking them about status um, unless they just want to tell us that information. Um, and we're not going to use that information unless they were a client anyway. So, um, so there's that. We also uh, fairly regularly conduct um, presentations, um, give trainings to um, our community partners and other stakeholders who um, we with whom we interact and so that they're educated kind of like today, but we might go more specifically about the rights of farm workers, the challenges they're facing. Um, we also have in the past uh, pre pandemic and will resume come next year done presentations to farm workers in person. Um, there's an organization called Tri Valley Opportunity Council, which is uh, the state of Minnesota's um, migrant education project. And so, um, you know, we'll, we'll meet with parents that throughout the state whose kids are enrolled in the child care services at those centers um, and inform them about their rights in a training format. We've done some of it virtually. We work with sometimes the Consulate of Mexico and do um, educational trainings online or in person. So that's kind of a snapshot. And then, of course, our legal rights or excuse me, legal representation as well when they are, when they do become a client. Um, in terms of programmatic improvements, um, we do ask uh, clients for feedback when we're closing their case, you know, when, um, when we kind of reach the last step of their case's journey. Um, and so we receive that and incorporate that as, a, as, um, as we're able. Um, and the, one of the other things that we're currently working on is we're doing a program-wide uh, needs assessment. And so um, we're working with a reputable um, local research agency called ASER. And so we've been doing focus groups, we've been doing a community partner survey. And right now we are uh, nearing the end of our farm worker survey where we have been um, asking farm workers who have um, worked in our two state service area within the past couple of years to give confidential anonymous feedback about um, their ideas and experiences, questions and concerns um, so that we can improve our services. And um, so that's the main way that we're doing that right now. And um, we look forward to reviewing the results for you know, tangible ways to improve. Uh, I would also add that we have um, 
like bi-weekly host office hours with our community partner, um, a health legal partnership mm -hmm. uh, at Red and Wayne Care Clinic. Mm -hmm. And they provide free or low cost um, health services to Red Wing residents. Um, and we've gotten the opportunity to interact with farm workers at that clinic. Um, so that is another um, service that we provide through that partnership. Um, do you want to talk at all about the kiosks? Oh, yeah. Um, sure. And so we just have so many things that um, we started doing within the past year or two, which is exciting. I mean, it's hard to keep track sometimes because <laughs> there's so many. Um, so one of the things that the pandemic made very evident was, um, you know, the lack of access to resources and access to justice. Um, it just became, you know, more evident. And so um, something that our unit decided to do was um, bring legal rights materials to farm workers, even if we're not there. And so we currently have three legal agricultural worker kiosks set up at three different locations, um, one in North Dakota and two in Minnesota at places where we know that agricultural workers frequent for um, the, the services that those respective locations provide. And so um, there, there's not only employment rate information, but also um, about like public benefits, housing, food, labor trafficking, family, um, local county resources. Uh, I'm blanking on some of the others, but just a host of information. And so we look forward to expanding those and um, those being utilized more and more. So what kind of cases does the program handle? Yeah. Um, I would say we accept cases um, if the if farm workers are eligible, of course, um, in wage theft. Um, so that is if they if the client's not being paid all of their wages, not being paid overtime, and they have um, overtime due to them. Um, minimum wage violations. Um, can you see like um, we do like appeal and their denial of unemployment benefits uh, occasionally, um, um, discrimination at work as mm -hmm. well, um, illegal retaliation um, are some examples of cases we handle. Um, health and, yeah, health, housing when it relates to health and safety. Um, if they're not getting breaks like they should be, um, potable water, just kind of sometimes miscellaneous rates. If there's contract violations, um, if they are maybe on an H2A visa, but they're not providing H, but they're not performing agricultural work, or they're maybe on an H2B visa, but they're not per, uh, performing <laughs> agricultural work. So, um, and then labor trafficking, where there's elements of force, fraud, and coercion, we can work with them if um, they're in need of, um, you know, some uh, a legal status so that they can be available to testify if needed for um, that investigation, um, so that they have a, yeah a status to live and work here in the U.S. Since the Agricultural Worker Project is under uh, Southern Minnesota Regional Legal Services, like how does it, uh, I guess, correlate with one another? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we are um, very definitely intertwined. Like we, whenever we speak, whenever we go out, we represent our parent agency, Smurls, we don't view ourselves as a standalone entity. We're in the Smurls, uh, not building, but on our the Smurls floor right now in downtown St. Paul. Um, you know, Smurls has, uh, has units that um, can assist uh, folks with elder law issues, housing, family, family law, consumer business, economic justice, um, education. Uh, we have our education, um, Law project and a couple other things as well. Um, immigration, immigration, healthcare legal partnership. Um, you know, sometimes we'll actually our attorneys will consult with folks like in the housing unit or make referrals within Smurls if a farm worker contacts us. And either we're not, um, we need some 
kind of guidance in the area if it's something we can assist with or we'll make a referral internally um, if it's like a family issue or you know not employment related um, and you know our our mission is the same as the organization so um, helping folks who have a low income to experience you know freedom from homelessness and poverty and um, some you know self empowerment and so um, when we meet, we try to um, fairly regularly also read this world's mission statement and remind ourselves that we're part of that community. And Laura, do you want to talk about RJC? Yeah, um, so I am also co-chair of the Racial Justice Committee. Um, and as a committee, we discuss internal and external policies that we um, want to work on, that we want to advocate within SMIRLs. Um, to change or just discuss um, any any issues um, that are going on in the community direct um, related to racial um, injustice. We discuss that as a committee and also um, uh, promote trainings related to racial justice mm -hmm. um, for small staff members uh, to participate in. Um, so that is something that the racial justice committee focuses on and right now we're working on a project to deliver a survey to the different units so that would include like the agricultural worker project housing family law um just to see what kind of racial justice issues each unit um sees that their clients face so that we're able to assess um what areas we're able to um, come up with solutions to, to improve or uh, work on and help these units come up with a work plan to um, to include as they're, as they're working to include racial justice um, initiatives in their work plans. Uh, how do you think the employment system affects immigrants and refugees? So when Lorna and I were talking through kind of the, the opportunity to, <laughs> to be here today and the, the category of the categories of um, immigrants and refugees, um, recognizing that there's a, there's some overlap with our project, even though we're not um, exclusively or even primarily serving those two populations, I would say. Um, but one thing to think about is that um, there is certainly an attitude, a negative attitude when people say um, skilled versus unskilled labor. And so when people say skilled labor, they're usually meaning, you know, you're in an office, you went to some sort of formal ed uh, training or education opportunity and unskilled. Usually they're meaning it's more with your hands, maybe it's vocational. Um, but right, there's a negative connotation to unskilled labor. And that that um, that distinction is dangerous because it's demeaning when in, and that would encompass uh, all, all, most of the work that agricultural workers do as well. And so um, we're we know that um, you know folks who come to the U.S. Um, there's push and pull factors. Um, they might be fleeing. They might be seeking a better opportunity. They're trying to reunite with family. Um, there's, it's dangerous um, in their home area, um, religious persecution, lots of different factors. Um, and so sometimes, you know, maybe they were trained in a very esteemed manner, manner in their home country, um, but it's not um, apples to apples here in the U.S. And so, um, you know, I'm, you know, we see, I shouldn't say we as in us, but in our personal lives uh, have seen um, people who um, are now in positions that they're way overqualified for and unfortunately look down on because, um, and then, you know, then there's sometimes also the attitude of, oh, you're taking jobs from U.S. workers, which is a whole different <laughs> unfortunate attitude that we won't go down that rabbit trail. But, uh, but in terms of agricultural workers, I think, um, and skill, and coming back to the unskilled versus skilled, um, encouraging folks to to shift their language and not use that distinction because it is harmful um, to immigrants, refugees, 
folks who were born and raised here in the U.S., right, who are performing, quote unquote, unspilled work, when in reality, um, there's always spills to be learned um, during any type of work that is performed. Um, and so that was one of the kind of main things that we talked about recognizing, again, that we're not regularly working with immigrants, refugees, um, but that that distinction can be harmful. I have one other thing to say, but I want to see if you want to add anything. Um, not at the moment. So if you go ahead. Okay. Um, the other thing is that, you know, we do see um, kind of some fear during outreach of folks who don't have a status for whatever reason that is. Um, and so if you're retaliation from coworkers who are either on a, here on a, a, a H2A visa or are domestic workers. And so, um, you know, although we again, don't necessarily represent them directly, um, we're able to still provide them information about their rights, general information, excuse me. Um, but again, like the, the, the documentation, the status differences sometimes do um, cause conflict even among coworkers who are doing, you know, the same type of important work. Um, so what do you guys want people to know about the Agricultural Workers Project? <laughs> <laughs> we have a whole lot of notes that we jotted down ahead of time, so we're just choosing what to share. Um, let's see. So I guess, okay, so we're not an advocacy organization because of um, our funding source, but we can provide information and are sometimes given um, permission to give opinions. Um, and so we do have one staff member or one of our attorneys sits on the governor's committee, uh, agricultural workers wellness committee. And so they're getting ready to submit um, proposals to the governor, um, recommendations related to labor standards, housing, and one other thing that I'm, let's see, workplace safety. Um, and so although we can't advocate, we can provide information um, and if so, and if you're ever interested in learning more, we would love to do a more ex, uh, sub substantive training um, on the rights of agricultural workers. Um, one thing I guess, um, you know, to encourage folks who are listening to viewers is um, to really uh, pay attention to where they're getting their produce from um, and their agricultural goods from. So not just fresh fruit and vegetables, um, but also pumpkins, your canned goods. Um, Minnesota has a lot of um, some pretty significant cannery um, production going on. So whether it's canned beans, canned beets, peas, corn, um, a host of other things, a lot of that is happening here in Minnesota. Um, and so, you know, some there are employers who um, are sometimes in the news because they are either alleged or it is discovered that they are truly not um, respecting the rights of workers uh, financially and otherwise. Um, and so that information, when it comes out, do pay attention to it. Sometimes otherwise um, COVID outbreaks at employment situations, um, sometimes that happens, but maybe if you wanna dig deeper and see if there's a, if the reason why is um, because the employer is not listening to um, workers, um, you know, it's, it's everyday folks who are able to put more pressure on um, businesses and legislative bodies to make change. And we can also vote with our dollars. Yeah, so in sum, just being mindful of um, where you're buying your, your groceries from is something very important. Mm -hmm. Are there any new goals or insights that the project will continue to work on for the future? And if so, what are they? Well, every year we do um, a staff retreat. It happened virtually this past year. Um, and so at that time there's, and that's at the beginning of the year, um, kind of an evaluation of how did outreach go last year? How did cases go last year? Kind of big picture stuff, thinking through the upcoming year. Um, and so 
although we haven't had that for this next season yet, um, you know, two of the areas that we want to continue to improve um, our outreach with our workers who do dairy work and also forestry work. Um, there's a couple aspects of those um, types of work that make it tricky for us to reach them. Um, whether for dairy workers, um, the best time of year for us to reach them is during the winter, but that can be, uh, weather can be a barrier. Um, and then forestry workers are really hard to locate because they're moving around a lot. Um, and they don't usually have employer provided housing. So we don't always know where they're living. Um, but those are, we've got some um, community partners and um, some previous staff who did some good research for us so that we can move forward in those areas. Yeah, and I will say um, one thing I forgot to mention earlier when you asked about our other services, what other services we provide, um, we do have a quarterly newsletter called the Quarterly Harvest, um, where we include information about um, different workers' rights, and we have staff spotlights, so you can learn more about um, our staff, um, the Agriculture Worker Project staff. Um, and I would say a goal would be um, being creative in the way we deliver the newsletter mm -hmm. so it reaches um, more farm workers. So that would also be um, helpful to share on social media, um, share with any farm workers people know. Um, the newsletters are accessible on our website. Um, so that is another resource we have available mm -hmm. for farm workers. We're a creative group, so we're, we usually have ideas flowing out of our minds on a weekly basis. <laughs> all right, well, that's all the questions that I have. Um, so I just wanna thank you so much for sharing with us today. Um, I appreciate the knowledge and experience that you both were willing to share with us and your dedication and hard work for the people. Um, so for everyone that is watching, um, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our next spotlight will be next week on Wednesday at 4 p.m. And it will take place on this page again. Uh, thank you all for watching. And I hope that we get to see you all next week again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.